Welcome to Dr. Roger and Friends, the bright side of longevity, hosted by three peas in a podcast, Doc Roger, Teresa, and Danielle. Thanks for joining us for Coffee and Conversation. Helen Dennis is a nationally recognized leader on issues of aging and the new retirement with academic, corporate, and nonprofit experience. She has received awards for her university teaching at USC's Davis School of Gerontology and for her contributions to the field of aging, the community, and literary arts. Editor of two books, author of over 100 articles, frequent speaker and weekly syndicated columnist on successful aging for the Southern California News Group, which reaches 1.6 million readers. She has assisted over 20,000 employees to prepare for the non-economic aspects of their retirement. Helen is co-author of the Los Angeles Times bestseller, Project Renewment, the first retirement model for career women, and has been recognized by PBS Next Avenue as one of the nation's 50 influencers in aging. Well, welcome, everybody. Well, today uh, we have, as you heard in the intro, uh, I think a heavy hitter in this whole movement towards successful aging. Uh, Helen has been at it a, a, a long time, dedicated to the message of successful aging, and she is getting out there, reaching people, again, as you heard in the, uh, the intro, but, you know, almost a couple decades of this, and, you know, 900 columns, and and uh, books and uh, f- forums for people to gather together to, uh, to explore this. So, Helen, you're doing great work, and we are indeed honored to have you here with us today. Thank you. I am delighted to be with all of you. Well, I'll, I'll jump in first. Uh, you know, as you know, successful aging is, uh, is what we've been doing. You and I never got the opportunity when, when we do get together to to uh, to talk about the specifics of of how each of us views that term successful aging. So you you write about it, you talk about it, you're a leader in this whole field. So how do you see? How would you define? Uh, that's a little formal, but how would you describe successful aging as you see it uh, and the way you uh, you articulate it so well with those who read and listen to you? So I have a very broad definition. The most simple way that I look at it is being the best you can be at your life stage. That means you may have a chronic condition, but you're doing all that you can to function as well as you can. To me, you're aging successfully. I completely separated from disease and illness. You can be in a wheelchair. And if you are doing all you can do to be as strong as you can physically and mentally, um, to me, you are aging successfully. So it's really related to function, separate from disease, and the intention of the individual. So it's a very broad, very broad definition. Someone who isn't aging successfully would be someone I would say who has poor nutrition, gets no exercise, has no sense of purpose, and is feeling terrible. I'd say you are not aging successfully because you're doing nothing to enable yourself to do it. So it's a very broad definition. I love it. Uh, Congrats. Because, uh, you know, some people think you've got to be skydiving at 85 or something like that to age successfully. You know, you probably are aware that 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 term came out of the MacArthur study, the 10-year-long study, and Dr. Bob Kahn was, you know, a co-leader of that. And uh, he he was some of one of our founding fathers in in Masterpiece Living that we're all associated with. And I remember him pulling me aside one day. And uh, it was something I had said that he wanted to make sure he corrected right away. He says, successful aging is, as you say but never say it so that someone gets the point that there's unsuccessful aging. You know, it's, it's not about a pass fail here. It's not about you, you gray, uh, you know, a gray thing, black or white. Uh, there's normal aging and then there's successful aging. So I think what you, how you define it is spot on Bob Kahn, who unfortunately passed about a year ago, uh, would love it. So 
thank you for that. Well, you're welcome. Um, and I, you know, you might remember that model uh, that he developed uh, on the components of successful aging. And a lot of it had to do with your intention rather than how you are evaluated. Absolutely. Absolutely. No doubt about that. And well, oh, we miss him, don't we, uh, Teresa, Danielle? He used to, uh, you know, if we ever uh, even veered off the rails a little bit, and I don't mean the rails are only one way to go, but reared off from the real message, the core of the message. He uh, very he, he also had a degree in literature. He would very, very uh, succinctly with a short story, powerful language, get us right back on. So it was a pleasure to work with him. You know, let me add something to uh, your comment, Roger. The, the, those who criticize that term, and there's lot, been lots of articles on it, say just that because it implies that you can be unsuccessful. Yes. And that's a kind of an unhealthy judgment call. So, yeah, it's a very valid. But again, if we acknowledge uh, the criticism, <laughs> then we're okay. So, so maybe I'll add something to that. As you know, I, I write this syndicated newspaper column. You're doing uh, <laughs> So, you know, everything has a story. That was never an intention of mine. About 20 years ago, the managing editor of our local newspaper calls me and said, Hannah, I don't remember her last name, is 88 years old, and she writes a column on seniors, but she wants to retire and write a book. Are you interested? Huh. I said, well, sure, why not? So she says, all right, give me 600 of your best, 600 words of your best writing, 12 topics you think the newspaper should cover and come to my office. So I thought, we are never finished jumping through hoops <laughs> of qualification, regardless of your life stage. So I met with them. They liked what I wrote. And they said, okay, do you want to write the column? I said, you know, I qualify chronologically to be a senior, but could we rename it? maybe something aspirational, uplifting. I said, how about successful aging? We'll check with our attorneys and that's fine. So that's how it started. Um, and, and I have to also say for the first five years, I never really mentioned it. I mean, here's my short sidebar story. I was, I was in Whole Foods and a person came up to me and said, oh, you're, the, you're the writer from the Daily Breeze. And I turned around to see who she was talking to. I never even, I, I didn't even identify myself. You're too humble. That's it. So, I mean, as, as time has moved on. Um, so I maybe want to share with you um, a little bit what I've learned from writing the column. Please. Um, so people want to be heard because essentially the column is a Q&A. They want to be heard. They want reliable and valid information. They want it to be readable. This should not be torture. So they want it to be interesting, maybe a little levity. Um, they want resources and they want to be appreciated. And when I figured that out, I would say that's part of the template. Um, and they keep coming back. <laughs> I'm not surprised at all that they do. You just espoused in just a few sentences uh, probably what every writer who is uh, wanting to articulate a message should know. And, uh, if, and if they don't, listen to Helen. You just did it, uh, Helen. I mean, uh, you, you covered the gamut of uh, what it is, I think, that, uh, that drives someone to read something and keep reading it and then stew about it during the rest of the day and, you know, and try to merge it into their lifestyle and into their lives and into their value system. So it's clear why you've had 900 columns or, or whatever and plus and going and that you uh, that you have so many. What you have like a, over a million and a half readers or something a week? Right. One, oh, one wow. Um, I understand so, why. <laughs> so the other thing that I was curious, what happens to the columns? I say, you know, writing a column is like teaching to an empty classroom. Okay. <laughs> you teach an empty classroom, you walk away, you're done. You have no idea what happens. Yeah, you get some feedback, you get some letters or emails, but you really don't know. But I want to share with you a, an experience. I spoke to a group, a few hundred people. I don't even know what I was talking about. And afterwards, a woman comes up to me and she takes my two hands. And she says, do you remember the column you wrote when your husband passed away about 14 years ago? 
it's a 14. I said, you remember? She said, I want you to know my husband died at that time too. And I want you to know how much it meant to me. So here we have these two women holding hands with tears running down their face. You don't know where the columns go. I do know they've been used for book groups. They've been used as discussion topics at senior centers. Uh, some political advocates have used them. Some of them, I never know if it's used for doggy training paper. I don't know who <laughs> that could be. Um, and some people file them. And many times they're re, uh, republished in newsletters, which is fine. I own, I have the copyright, all the columns, it's open. And so it's once a week I have a deadline. I mean, so I say, I must be a masochist. Who does that to themselves for 19 years? Either that or I loved writing papers in college, which I didn't particularly do. <laughs> um, so, my, you know, and people said, so why do you, why do you keep doing this? And it's a really kind of corny answer, if it makes a difference. That's what that. it's about. That's yeah, what it's about. Corny, that's, uh, that's purpose uh, sort of in the spotlight. That's the gold medal of purpose as far as I'm concerned. And, and particularly during this time, I think when so many people are um, certainly available to read, take the time to sit down and read uh, and, uh, and, and searching for uh, the kind of messaging that you're talking about. Um, um, I mean, Helen, you're, um, you're, you're, a, you're a anti covid hero here. <laughs> I say we are not going down the rabbit hole, folks. <laughs> we are not. Well, for sure. Well, I've been dominating it, and I know these two ladies I work with uh, have questions for you, so have at it, ladies. Well, speaking of purpose, Helen, we, we know that you and, and a colleague started a movement called Project Renewment, and, and there's a book, I think, with the same title. Can you tell us about that? Yes, everything has a story, and this one has one also. <clears throat> this is about um, 19 years ago, a colleague very good colleague, Bernice Bratter, calls me and said, <clears throat> is there anything in the literature, any programs about career women who are passionate about their work, love their work, identify with it, how they move on to retirement? She said, because I'm having a hard time. At that point, I said, Bernice, we aren't even on the radar. The retirement models typically are male and they're typically financial. So she said, well, let's get, to, let's get together for lunch, see if we have anything to discuss. And that was a four-hour lunch. She proceeded to say, well, maybe you invite some like-minded women. I'll do the same, and we'll get together at my house for dinner. It was a four-hour dinner. And we decided we had a lot to talk about. So we continued to meet monthly. For the first five years that we met, we recorded our conversations. We didn't know what the it was, but we know no one was talking about this in 1999. We had no intention of expanding. I always thought there was a book here somewhere, but uh, no intention of starting a membership organization. We just wanted to meet. Well, other women on the west side of Los Angeles found out about us. They said, gee, could we join your group? Hmm. It's hard to join in them. We said, you know, we'll help you start a group. Well, then there was another group of women said, well, gee, can we join your group? We'll say, mm, we'll help you start a group. So what has happened over the years, virally, 35 to 40 renewment conversation groups have emerged across the country. One actually started in Paris. Um, so, so that's, so then we have 30, so what is renewment? First of all, renewment is a combination of retirement and renewal. Okay, with the implicit message that retirement can be a period of renewal if you make it so. Um, the intention was that women would take their creativity, their energy, their insight, their experience, and apply that to the next chapter of life to make it equal, if not better, than the previous one. So that was the overall mission. Um, we talked about things such as, uh, who am I without my business card? What happens to your identity? Mm. So how do you define productivity when there's no boss or objectives that someone else is setting? And what happens if he retires first? Mm -hmm. uh, so based on our conversations, this is kind of the second part of our story. 
we got some press from LA Times and Time Magazine Online. And the CEO of Scribner, which is a sub of Simon & Schuster, which just been sold, um, found the journalist who wrote the article and they called us. They said, we'd like you to write a book. We said, sure, we can do that. So 18 months later, we wrote, we submitted a manuscript for Project Renewment, the first retirement model for career women. And to our total shock and amazement, it made the LA Times bestseller list. Total shock. Uh, so it's reprinted in paperback. So let me just add one other piece. The group is not a traditional support group, okay? But it is supportive of one another, okay? But it isn't a, tr- we don't fix people who have significant adjustment issues. Um, so moving forward, um, COVID comes along. The women can't meet, which typically would be in a person's home, eight to 10 women. <laughs> Um, they can't meet. So what are we going to do? So Bernice and I said, well, let's, let's, let's go for a lark. We're going to invite, go to our database and just say, this is an invitation to 15 women, first come, first serve. We're launching the renewment roundtables. Well, 15 show up and then we had a waiting list and then we had group two and then we had a wait. So tomorrow we're launching group eight because there is a continuous waiting list. And here's the silver lining. We have women from across the country, from Florida, from Washington, from Tennessee, from Colorado, and women who typically would not meet. And all of them, I would say, come with some very meaningful work experience um, and very diverse. So we meet for an hour every three weeks, and we talk about how are you, what's new, and then we talk about a topic, relationships, big decisions in my life how I'm adjusting to, uh, to this new environment. And what's happening, first, they continue to show up. But second, things happen. We had a woman who just, her husband died. She sold, wanted to sell her home, wants to move to Palm Springs. And we have a woman who is a real estate agent and a psychologist, finds the perfect house for the perfect woman. In one week, she finds the woman a house, she moves to Palm Springs, and they are friends. Another woman, retired um, prosecutor from New Jersey, all of her volunteer activities diminished. We have a woman who was active in Grandparents for Democracy, needed more volunteers, once in New Jersey, once in Washington. They are working together. So it's very organic. And I, there is an it here somewhere. Something is going on, haven't quite defined it, and beginning to take notes. But it, it's a question is, what do women who have made their mark and continue to make their mark facing the most disruptive event, aside from losing a loved one, in their entire lives? And how do they manage this? What do they do with their lives? And what lessons can we learn? So that's the kind of information I'm looking at. That sounds like you're you're harvesting uh, human capital out there, double X <laughs> uh, chromosome wise, human capital, and uh, I, you know, like you're almost like you're playing the classic role of the grandmother, but for adult career women, you know, and uh, post career women, and uh, boy, we, don't we need a lot more of that, you know, rather than uh, you know, sort of wasting all this human capital that's out there as we do as a society. This is this is marvelous. So. Congrats on that. And I love that in your whole story, Helen, from the time you're starting your column to today, you know, sometimes opportunities found you and with every challenge, you're like turning it into an opportunity when you can turn COVID into an opportunity to connect women from around the world. That's pretty remarkable. So it's an inspiring story. Now, I have a two part question for you. So you've been in the field of aging for more than 40 years. There's 
positive stuff and then there's lots of challenges we still have to face. So can we start with the successes? What kind of progress have you seen us make? So I'm going to just add a, being in the fields for so many years. Um, it was a time when people thought gerontology was a skin disease, like dermatology. <laughs> so that, that gives you a context of where I've been and where I've come from. So your question is progress. Mm-hmm. Yes. The good yeah, I mean, I think I think we should continue to be very hopeful. I mean, one is longevity, which is all of your career and business. People are living longer. Not so good morbidity. They're a little longer, not feeling so well, but we are increasing life um, uh, life expectancy. So I think that's one big plus. You know, another big plus that I found from working with um, 20,000 employees on retirement education is that individuals have high expectations from this life stage. And I think that's a motivator. Mm. Uh, it's a motivator in terms of they're saying, you know, what is next? So that's a big plus. I think another big plus is that, quote, the new life stage is being recognized. This period between 60 and 80, um, uh, you know, have Mark Friedman, Ken Dykewald, uh, Mary Catherine Bates, and all saying it's it's great that we we added years to the end of life, but we've added these very unique years kind of towards the mid to later life. And they're really ones of opportunity. There's no question with age comes risk and illness, and, and that's a, that's a reality. But there are opportunities in this life stage that we could begin to recognize. And it's so new that we really haven't decided what to call that life stage. You know, the third age, you know, renewment. Um, there are many different, you know, generativity. We don't know what to call it. So I think recognition of a new life stage and all that, the, the opportunities. But I think one of the hottest areas in aging right now is technology. Mm-hmm. I mean, that is just sizzling from uh, telehealth to personal response systems to products and services. Um, I attended a tech conference and what was demonstrated a shoe that you could, if you could not tie your shoes, there was a shoe that you slip your foot into and the back opens up. And then when you put your foot on the ground, the back of the shoe closes. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to tie your shoes. You don't even have to bend over. I mean, small things that make life easier for individuals. Uh, We have, um, I think, an increased recognition of a consumer market. I mean, older adults contribute, uh, contribute close to $7 trillion in economic activity. And yet it's taken business a long, and it's, it's taken business a long time to acknowledge that older adults are consumers. They're, they have the money, mm-hmm. but it's taken a long time for that recognition, despite, despite the evidence. So the fact that businesses are acknowledging older adults means that their businesses will be more catered to an older generation. I think that's a big plus. Yeah. I, I think it's also a plus that we have more universities and colleges teaching aging um, and medical schools. That is a big plus in terms of a recognition. Uh, so, so, you know, we've, we've made progress. I would also say a keen awareness of uh, what we call healthy aging to the extent people are doing it is another question, but they are aware. They may be informed, but the actual behavior may not align with their knowledge. Um, but I think an increased awareness of what healthy aging is about. I think we're making progress. And I have to say, I think the field is as exciting today as it was 20 or 30 years ago and has more opportunity today, I think, than ever. That is wonderful. So what is our biggest challenge? If you had to uh, uh, pick one or two things, that we, where do we still have to go? I think one of the largest challenges is ageism because it pervades everything. Uh, It pervades employment. It pervades medicine. uh, It pervades also nonprofit organizations. It pervades universities. So ageism is a a big one. Um, So the the second, I would say, is Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. We still don't have an agreed upon cause. We don't have agreed upon treatment. We don't have an agreed upon cure. So with an aging population, I think 
Alzheimer's disease is a huge challenge. Mm-hmm. Um, so I would say ageism, Alzheimer's disease, I'm probably related to that as caregiving. Yeah. I mean, we can predict probably the percentage of older adults that are going to need care with longevity, with dementia, with conditions which, which are limiting. Um, so I think that caregiving is also a very big one. You know, it's, uh, I, th- I think the demographics are, it, it, this is all going to happen. You know, because the demographics will drive it. A society is going to have to respond to these things. But if it goes at the current pace, you know, there's going to be a lot of uh, older adults disenfranchised and uh, and uh, probably robbed of uh, quality of life and uh, unable to compress their morbidity. So uh, I think what what we do collectively, our team, you, and so many of our colleagues that we. Uh, that we get to interact with periodically. I think our whole idea is to accelerate this, you know, (laughs) maybe COVID is going to accelerate it a little bit also. Uh, Although the, the, the whole idea of ageism and COVID, there's been some very disturbing uh, language around that, you know, uh, relative to who is most at risk and who does indeed tend to succumb. Uh, And uh, I don't have to go into it, but that's very disturbing, uh, conversation so if someone is homebound um with limited income and living alone to tell them you know old age is great (laughs) we've made so much progress uh there are people who are suffering uh i love the term the term food scarcity that's called hunger okay We, we 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 package it so it doesn't it sounds more polite but there, and even though we know that it seems that um, older adults actually are faring better than younger adults during the pandemic, that's not to say there is suffering going on of loneliness and isolation. And that's not to say about worry, I need to work. I've been furloughed, but I, I think I'm going to be the first out. This pandemic is going to give my employer an opportunity to get rid of the older workers. Mm-hmm. Uh, so even though in the literature and the data, older adults may be doing better. That doesn't mean they're doing well. It may be that they're just not as bad. <laughs> I have one question. So, Helen, you've been named one of the top 50 people in aging by Next Avenue. And you're a delegate to the White House Conference on Aging and National Award for Excellence in Education and Training. And I could go on, but I'll stop there. Tell us what accomplishment you're most proud of. No one's ever asked me that um, yeah. because I don't talk about my accomplishments. I, I think I feel best about writing a column that makes a difference. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you can write book chapters. That's important. You can teach at a university. That's all important. But there's something at the ground level that you know this did make a difference somewhere. And if I get a letter or an email that says, thank you so much, you know, that information really helped me. And now my daughter, my husband, whatever, um, I don't think it gets better than that. So here is a perspective that is not often mentioned. And I believe we have responsibility to take care of ourselves for so many different reasons. One, so we can function well. Two, do a favor to your family and friends. And if you want to talk about the economics of it, you're doing a favor to your country. So we have a responsibility to take care of ourselves. And I think the other responsibility is to give back and be kind and good to others. Um, I think those aspects are not often discussed. So that's we as older adults. I mean, yes, it's a free ride, maybe, because I'm retired, but I'm saying it's not. We continue to have a a responsibility. I I can't imagine it would. I, um, well, that's an answer that uh, I'm not surprised to hear, but uh, it's, um, I think it's so on, on target. And uh, it's, it's, it's clear that you're, you've been so persistent and so excellent and so committed to this that uh, even if you weren't thinking about it, 
there it is. I, I can imagine, uh, you know, and I was in preventive medicine, as you know, and so you never really see the results. You never see so much what you prevent. Uh, and so uh, when the occasion would occur that someone would come to you and say, you know, that meant everything to me, uh, that meant everything to me to, to, uh, to hear that. So I think as you get responses or, or just the questions that, you know, if someone answers is suffering and asks you a question, you know that there are tens of thousands out there uh, also with the same problem since we all have a pulse and we share some very common things that, that to help that one person to help so many more, uh, it's, it's got to be rewarding. So excellent. Yeah. Before we wrap up, I don't want to hang up with you without finding out or letting people know where can they go to learn more about you and your work. Oh, nice to ask. So if they're interested in Renewment, go to renewment.org. And if anyone is interested in joining a Renewment Roundtable, write to me at Helen Den, H-E-L-E-N-D-E-N-N, at gmail.com. And I have my own website is HelenMDennis.com. Okay, thank you. And we'll put that in the description of this podcast so people can find you. Well, thank you so Helen, much. keep up what you're doing. It's great work. It's, I'm proud to be call you a colleague, and I'm proud to have you in Aging Services and in this, this whole movement. So I look forward to the next time we can meet. I do too. And I think the, the, the strong message to me is that this is a really collective mission. You know, they say we're all in this together. We truly are. Um, and I think what's always struck me in the whole field of aging is how generous everyone is. They share resources. They share their knowledge. Um, and there's enough business and opportunity to go around to everyone times 10 because there's so much work we have to do. So well, I'm delighted to have you as my colleague and your team members. Thank you. And uh, what a wonderful excuse that we can get together uh, despite or in spite of the pandemic. So thank you. Uh, I've enjoyed being with you. You've been very generous with us. Thank you, Helen. Bye now. You've been listening to Dr. Roger and Friends, The Bright Side of Longevity. If you like the show, please rate and review and be sure to click to follow. Follow. 